Yeah, speaking of the future, like we've all seen over the past couple of years, maybe four years, the amount of investment that has been put into sports in Saudi Arabia, bringing in world-class talent, building state-of-the-art facilities. How do you see the future from here? Like everyone is wondering, so what's going to happen next? And it's good that here we have more on the niche sports. It's not the mainstream sports, it's not football where everyone plays it. So how do you see it changing and how... What do you think would happen next in this regard? Oh, yeah, hi, Sam. Um, I already mentioned earlier the support of the Ministry of Sports and the Saudi Olympic Committee, and you can see the, the number of events we are hosting, interna uh, international events. For me, as an athlete and as a recruiter, I would say the best, and I think this, this point may be overlooked sometimes by the international media, is the effect that hosting these events are having to local talent. It's exposing people to what world-class athleticism looks like. So you know exactly sort of what levels, what's expected to be world-class. Whereas before maybe, you know, the access to these sort of athletes weren't, uh, weren't here. For example, Cristiano Ronaldo here, the, the impact he's having on his players, but also on aspiring footballers in the country. So on one hand, you know, the top-down approach is, you know, we're very grateful for it. There's huge investment in it. And the quality of life, uh, you know, the, the direct impact for quality of life for people in this country is, is uh, undoubted. For where I'm more interested in, honestly, is sort of a more of a bottom-up approach. Um, and when you look at every country, all the most successful countries in the world, sporting-wise, let's say the UK and the US, they have an incredibly competitive sporting culture within schools and universities. So by, by the time these students graduate, they're already world-class athletes with minimal public funding. And this is something that's also being invested now by the ministry and the Saudi Olympic Committee. And this is something I'm super excited about because we have such a talented group of you know, young um, uh, population. And all they need is just access. You give them access and opportunity and give it a couple of Olympiads, which is a four-year period, um, I promise you, you'll start seeing results. And this is what's happening now. There's massive reform happening now, and uh, I can't wait to see the results. And Amor, for the tennis, where do you see the tennis going? Like, we've had the biggest matches played on, in Saudi over the past year, yeah. I guess. So what next? What's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, we've seen the ATP Next Gen uh, in Jeddah, and we have a uh, program with them for the next five years. And then we saw with the Riyadh uh, Season Tennis Cup, these exhibitions bring in big numbers. I mean, I remember going there, and the tickets were sold out in a matter of minutes um, for the men's and women's, which is not necessarily uh, happens worldwide. Um, and yeah, I mean, we want to see more people involved in terms of not just playing, but just engaging in the sport. Uh, whether it be in a spectator role, whether it be in communities, whether it be coaching, whether it be, there's a wide variety of opportunities that tennis has to offer. And we just want to see more Saudis involved in the world of tennis here and abroad. Yeah. And Abdelaziz, yeah. like Formula One, Formula <laughs> E, Rallies. We are lucky. Motorsports yeah. is taking over the country, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Ammar. It's changing everything. And even what Hussein said about the young generation being inspired. Now, what I would say is that the big investment in Saudi Arabia about motorsport is how we are educating the community as a community that this is a motorsport and this is something that is huge. And I mean, we are sitting here and I, I can't help myself seeing that there is a one-seater race car over there. And six years ago from now, I, I wouldn't even believe or dream that this will happen in Saudi Arabia. So now to have the biggest... Uh, motorsport races in the world happening in Saudi Arabia. As you have said, Formula One, Formula E, Rally Dakar, Extreme E, even on the boats, as uh, I, I'm pretty sure Hussein have heard, the E1 race, which was something happening in Jeddah like less than a month ago, is all about having the bigger uh, picture inside the sport itself. So the number of people now participating in motorsports are increasing hugely. The last season itself, in one round in hill climb, we had a record of 142 cars participating in one race. It means like the people are passionate. We love the cars. We love the motorsport. And now we have the chance to do it in the right place. And even now, the community can see it as a positive thing because we are building a sport. It's not only 
reckless driving. It is something that is uh, on a higher level. It's a different level of engagement, different level of competition. And uh, hopefully this is, will open up a huge doors for the next generations. So if someone is now crazy about driving and about motorsports, where do they go? What do they do? Yeah, oh, it's, it's more easier now than ever. You can start anywhere. We have a racing simulators in Saudi Arabia. You have a small races that you can attend to with a normal car. You don't have to buy a race car just to be a race car driver. You can have a normal car. You can go do autocross. We have a uh, Saudi Motorsport Federation. They have launches every season now since 2019, like a few races across the entire season, the whole year, with different categories. And this year, they're even including the karting as one of the races. So you have autocross, you have hell climb, you have time attack, even you have rally, which is something off-road that our people in Saudi Arabia love too much, which is so easy to get in. So yeah, the options are there. It's easy to get involved. And Ammar, same question. If someone wants to start in tennis now, like a young person, maybe a bit older, where should they go? What they should do? I mean, yeah, I mean, the Federation is incorporating a bunch of programs for pe people to get started. I mean, there's a bunch of courts that are being built in the communities nowadays. Academies popping up right and left. So I guess reaching out to the Federation, looking at opportunities, and then reaching out to other players and uh, trying to set up times and go for hits and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And for rowing, I have a question, though. Like, we were talking about the technology and the AI. Is it making growing a bit more accessible? So now you don't have to have like the, to be living by a river or by a sea and you can just do it. I see it at the gym and I don't know if it works. So can you tell us about that and then how can people join? Yeah, so there are two, I guess, categories. There's, there's rowing on the water, which is what rowing is known for. Um, when the word rowing means on water. So indoor rowing is sort of a different sport and that's what you're referring to on the machine. And uh, actually, Mo almost all of our recruits came from the CrossFit community because in CrossFit, indoor rowing, the rowing machine is part of like almost all the workouts. So when these athletes found out that there is now rowing a federation, there are competitions and there's suddenly an Olympic pathway to the Olympics, they got excited and they, they signed up. So I think, yeah, they're all from the CrossFit community. Um, but there is almost zero transferable skill from the machine to the water. If you're excellent on the machine, it's just a display of strength and fitness, essentially. And I put you on a boat, you'll fall in immediately. And actually, there are many cases where someone is less fit and strong than uh, their competitor, but they will still beat them on the water because the technique, the skill, the biomechanics that goes into energy transfer from your body to the oars, it's just so technical that um, it takes years to perfect that stroke. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's about efficiency. So if I'm less fit and strong than you, but I'm more efficient, then I'll be faster than you in the water. And this can be very frustrating because you can be sizing up your opponent before the race. You know, I'm bigger, I'm taller, I'm, but uh, he'll, still, he'll still beat you. So that's the beauty of rowing. You know, it's not all about strength and, and fitness. Uh, the technique is... is it's like a bottomless pit, you know, you, you never, no one's perfect uh, in rowing. Everyone has got a different technique. It's just this impossible thing, incredibly frustrating thing to try and uh, master. But uh, it's, it's interesting. Even in the Olympic final, you'll see very different styles. Um, for accessibility, I mean, we have two rowing uh, clubs at the moment, one in Durat al Arus in Jeddah and one in Jebel in the East Coast. Until Riyadh gets a lake, which I hope will be very soon, which has to be more than two kilometers long, then we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll come visit. Yeah, I'll come visit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just sign up. Um, if you live in these cities, obviously very easy. Uh, and they are, you know, we'll wait for that lake, inshallah. But uh, yeah. Okay, unfortunately, we're running out of time. It's not every day that I get to share the stage with like literal champions. So thank you very much. And... We're looking forward to see you when Riyadh has a lake and to see what else is going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.